Hi, this is Debbie Dashinger, and welcome to Dare to Dream. The show has been nominated for two People's Choice Podcast Awards for a Webby Award, and we are listed in Welp Magazine as one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to this year. I've been doing the show for 14 and a half years on radio and podcast, and it is because of people like my guest today that I still love to show up. Curiosity is deep for me. I want to thank Dr. Dane here and Access Consciousness for their sponsorship of the show. They do beautiful energy work out into the world, and we appreciate the work they do. If you'd like to become a facilitator, if you'd like to take one of their courses, go to Dr. Dane here, H E E R.com or accessconsciousness.com. I'm Debbie Dashinger, and I teach entrepreneurs, business people, and speakers the ways to write a highly engaging book. I also have a company that takes an author's book to a guaranteed international bestseller, and it's fully done for you. And I show you how to use podcast and radio interviews for massive results. I've got some great gifts for you so you can learn how to start implementing these things right away. If you'll go to debbiedashinger.com slash gift and get your templates, tools, and videos to start on this path because the world needs us right now and our message. That's D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com slash gift. Today, I've got a conversation coming up and it's going to be regarding ancient aliens, modern extraterrestrials, plus spacecraft, time travel, and more. My guest is William Henry, who is an investigative mythologist, art historian, and expert guide to ancient sites. He's the co-star and consulting producer of Ancient Aliens on the History Channel, and William hosts two series on Gaia TV. William brings to life ancient wisdom stories through art and historic texts, while he teaches the secrets of the soul from the ancient cultures and through time and space. He leads sacred adventure travels to ancient sites around the world. And if you'd like to learn more, go to williamhenry.net. And with that, I welcome William to the Dare to Dream show. So good to have you. Thank you, Debbie. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm excited for this conversation. And you offer so much in this realm. So I'm going to start with reset the reset. Because okay. you said that now we as children of light, it's our time to reset the reset, that it's time for us to break through the chaos to help heal ourselves and the world. And I mm -hmm. love that. So what are the important factoids for us to know about this reset and how we can implement that? The thing is, is that most of us, all, all of us now are aware that our world is shifting and the, the shift is accelerating. It's getting more and more rapid every day. And we realize that there is, uh, they call it an element on the planet that is kind of acting a little too authoritarian, totalitarian. They're, they're walking over our spiritual selves. They're eliminating our freedom of speech, our freedom of movement. They're telling us things that aren't true and they're controlling us. And they call this the great reset. This is a term that came from the World Economic Forum. They've been using it, well, since I've been tracking them since around 2017. This is of course a group of people who maintain they're the elite and they, they're, it's their prerogative to decide that, that humans are gonna shift and the, the primary modality they want us to shift into is into a, a an artificially intelligent version of ourselves. They, they have a plan that they've been implementing for the past 10 years to move the herd into uh, a, a time when we are merged with artificial intelligence, when in their words, our bodies become so high tech, we won't even know ourselves. And this is a, a, a scenario that I've been talking about since really for 20 years, since 2002. And Back in 2002, it was 30 years away, but now in 2022, it's upon us now. And, and a lot of people are starting to wonder, well, what is really going on here in our world? And, and why do I want to turn myself into a machine? And is it, is it really just all about 
these major corporations, Apple, Samsung, Sony, Sam, and, and other corporations, Microsoft making trillions of dollars and taking control of every single human life on this planet. Yeah, that's what it's about from their perspective. But I've been on the side over here saying, well, wait a minute, as spiritual beings, that isn't really that conducive to our soul. Th this scenario is rife with danger. And the road ahead of us uh, in this form of a reset is filled with potholes and broken bridges. And we have to, as spiritual beings, become as aware as possible of what the implications of this type of reset are, and then take the responsibility to reset the reset which is what, what my work is about. And, and it's essentially in its core, the resetting the reset is to say, I still want to be treated as a spiritual being. While many of these AI engineers and these corporations are atheistic at their core, I'm still a spiritual being and I prefer to be treated that way. And, and I would like for there be uh, leadership in this world that still maintains a spiritual perspective about the advancement of the human race. In other words, we're not only going to and exclusively going to advance by turning ourselves into machines and becoming puppets on the string of, of uh, Silicon Valley and the governments that are now controlled by Silicon Valley. Instead, we, we want to be self-determined. We want to operate from our own individual soul, and we want to be part of a collective that is aiming to advance the human race in a spiritual, soul-based manner. Can you give an example of one of the ways that these companies are starting to infiltrate and starting to take over and implement this AI mentality? Total censorship on Facebook? and other social media, uh, control of, of the media, the coercion uh, to get kids to uh, use virtual reality, to accept online learning, uh, constant barrage of messaging that this world sucks, that uh, in fact, humanity sucks and we're awful people and we deserve to, to get whatever we get from the machines that are coming. This is a, a constant refrain of now Hollywood and, and Silicon Valley merged together. And those are just beginning examples. And for some, they think, oh, this is just, we're just playing games. You know, these are just computer games and this is just virtual reality. This is just social media. But it, it, it's far more insidious than that because behind it is a very well-planned, uh, call it an operation to shift us out of our organic selves into an inorganic machines type state of existence. And then beyond that, to drop our physical existence altogether and become exclusively virtual beings living in their fake reality and their simulated realities online. What can we do? Are there ways for those of us who are spiritual and who really hear this message that you're delivering? Mm -hmm. What can we do to turn this around and be part of the change? Part of what we have to do, it begins with one recognizing that this new system, this great reset is entirely dependent on you clicking your life away, okay? That spending more than just the eight hours that the average person spends a day on the screen is their goal. They, they want your eyeballs as many hours as possible, because if they have your eyeballs, they're collecting your data, they're utilizing your data, which is your life in ways that you have no clue about. So learning about what these corporations do with your data, how they consider that they own you and your data, you're, you're just simply property to them, you're being utilized as a way for them to make massive sums of money. And then two, recognize the, the power of exponentialism, that one or two people telling two people telling two people suddenly starts to get a, a tremendous multiplier effect. And, and this is what we need right now. And people are beginning to, to wake up. They are understanding that there is this, this element that seeks total control. And, and that is not a, 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 a spiritual imperative that anybody wants to answer to any longer. Amazing. Powerful. I'm going to switch gears a little bit and bring in other worlds. 
um, mm -hmm. other people, the visitors. So what's going on now? You're on the pulse of this scientifically. Is there anything new at this time regarding the visitors? Is there advanced science? Is there movement forward to conscious contact beyond what most of us know? I don't see a, a huge movement towards conscious contact in mass, uh, which is kind of strange because at the same time that we, we know disclosure is unfolding, we, we know that any visitor is not going to want to negotiate with 185 individual governments on this planet. They're going to want to negotiate with a, a, a unified entity of some kind. But at the same time, contact is unfolding on an individual basis. Millions of people around the world are, are having these experiences. So it's a little bit of a, a, a contradiction right now in terms of what is happening with, with disclosure. But once again, it, it takes it down to the individual level that those who are having these, these contact experiences and those who are researching extraterrestrial intervention in human affairs are making a difference just by putting their, their intention and putting their attention on these questions. What got you into your work, William? What did you have an experience? Have you had contact with a visitor? What, what caused you to become so interested in ancient sites, ancient aliens, all of this mm -hmm. subject matter? Well, I, I grew up in Detroit, Michigan. I moved to Nashville uh, when I was a teenager to go to college. I was going to be an entertainment lawyer. And there's a, there's a small college here in Nashville that offered an entertainment music business program that would get you ready to go work on Music Row or Hollywood or, or wherever. And uh, the catch was that this college was a Southern Baptist college. And this meant you had to go to chapel, you had to take Bible study classes, and I knew nothing about the Bible growing up. I, I like to say in our home, the four apostles were Waylon, Willie, Chris, and Johnny. And that was the, about the extent of my religious upbringing. It was all about country music. And what happened was, uh, excuse me, sorry, uh, through uh, this, this school, I started taking Bible study classes and became tremendously interested in the origins of Christianity because I, I learned very quickly that the, the original version of Christianity, which was highly mystical, which involved contact with angels and otherworldly beings and also ascension to other worlds, that, that all of that had been taken out of Christianity before it was massively promoted by the church. And I wanted to know what where, where is the, the what, where is this the secrets of original Christianity? And when, for example, the, the Jewish mystics out of which the, the first Christians emerged, the, a group mystical group called the Essenes, they claimed in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were their texts, that they were living with angels and that angels were teaching them how to transform themselves into angels. And I was instantly hooked on this. I wanted to know more about who were these angelic beings? They're obviously some kind of extraterrestrial beings. And is it possible for a human to transform into an angelic being and go live in these celestial worlds? And what did you find out? <laughs> <laughs> I found out that not only is it possible, but the Essenes were actually doing this. And that, of course, there's an opposing force on this planet that doesn't seem to want humanity to know about any of this. And this gets back to uh, some of those control issues we talked about a moment ago. What we're living in today really goes back to the origins of, of Western civilization. And this is something that a lot of people don't really think a lot about or, or really give a lot of consideration to, but I think it's, it's, it's highly important for us to think about. And just very briefly, in Western civilization, is based on the premise that humans originated in a higher, finer realm that we call the Garden of Eden. And then we were evicted from the Garden of Eden, of course, after Eve eats the, the wisdom of the serpent. And this, this is then called the fall of man. And in Western civilization, which is rooted in the, the holy books of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, the premise is, is that one day, 
we will be able to return to that higher, finer realm. They introduce various ways that that can happen um, in Christianity. This is the mission of Jesus, and it's also the, the purpose of the second coming is to lead us back into this state of perfection. And, and that is the word that they use. We were originally perfect beings, then we fell, and now we're less than perfect. We're trying to return to our original state of wholeness, holiness, or perfection, as they call it. And what started to develop is uh, uh, monks and, and other uh, holy people would, would spend all of their time, day to day, focused on returning to their original state of perfection through meditation, through contemplation, through studying sacred scripture. And then around the 10th century, technology started to be introduced where a, a group of people said, hey, uh, you know, we're starting to use technology, eyeglasses to, to, to perfect the body. We're using plows that can be pulled by multiple oxen. So now we don't have to be out in the field 10 hours a day. We can reduce our workload and do it now in four hours. That gives us all kinds of time to go back to our original work project, which is to perfect ourselves and to return to our original state of perfection. So there, there came along this, this belief that the technology is a gift from God, that God wants us to use all this technology to perfect ourselves. And this really started to accelerate dramatically in the 1950s and then in through the 70s, then the internet comes along in the 90s. Now in the year 2000, you've got all these major corporations that are dedicated exclusively to perfecting us by replacing our organs, by introducing uh, mRNA technology into our genome by utilizing AI, by using neural link chips in the case of Elon Musk that, hey, suddenly the human body's fair game and, and we're going to all become these perfect beings that can live for hundreds of years and have IQs of 10,000 and all these other attributes. And, and that's where we're at right now is we're running sort of a parallel race where you've got millions of people around the world that for the first time in history, in my view, are simultaneously practicing meditation, they're doing yoga, they're doing all these practices that the ancients said will ultimately help you to attain perfection and your re return to your original uh, divine status as a being of light. And then you simultaneously have the technological path that is saying, no, this is the path you want to go. Forget about anything spiritual. All that's that's old, you know, that's old metaphysical nonsense. That's before we knew about science, Bubba. Now we know all about science and, and forget about all those gurus and all that religious bullshit. That 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 stuff's just nonsense. You just need to follow the technological path and, and forget about all that. And, and that's where we're at right now. So we've got kind of these two entwined serpents that are vying for our, our attention. They're, they're, they're vying for our, literally our, our souls. And people have to, I think, have to become aware of where we've been to understand where we're at right now. And that, that's in large part what I'm, I'm trying to uh, work on. What about Ascension Keepers? I know that's mm -hmm. uh, something you talk about from prehistoric times and that mm -hmm. there are practices from this prominent group that we potentially can reclaim and right. look at the ancient teachings. Is there anything there that's notable? Absolutely. And one of the key things, the reason why I did that series, Ascension Keepers for Gaia, is I, I've been uh, talking and, and researching and presenting about Ascension for 15, 20 years. And what I started to notice is that Ascension is, is becoming a, a more and more popular topic. And a, a lot of the people that are getting into it don't realize that it has this ancient pedigree that actually Ascension has been the original human project since virtually the very beginning. And that that is very helpful to know because it tells us that there's a solid path that our souls have been uh, following uh, from incarnation to incarnation. I mean, many of the people that are on the ascension path have a real deep knowing that this isn't their first rodeo. This isn't their first life. And they, they have a sense that they've had perhaps numerous past lives. And all of their past lives more than likely have been devoted to this ascension path. And that perhaps in this lifetime, they will be able to complete their ascension 
and then ultimately ascend to other realms. And so the, the point of Ascension Keepers was to point uh, modern day Ascension practitioners to a, a, a list of practitioners. I, I, I call them Ascension Keepers, people that have been on this path through the past millennia so that now modern day Ascension Keepers can go back and understand those teachings, see who, see who the players were, understand the development and see that, hey, there, there's not just one way or one path that leads to this ascension, that in fact, there are many ways. And that in fact, in all of the, the world's uh, sacred and spiritual and religious traditions, at the core of them is this idea of humans being able to scale a, a ladder to heaven, that, that we're all somewhere on that, that pathway, we're all somewhere on that ladder. And the point of our life is to make it to the next higher level. And some of them, like the Essenes, like the Gnostics, Ascension Keepers, essentially, did they meet their own demise? Did they leave with, live with a degree of suppression? All of them did. It's, it's, it's a thread that runs through all of the Ascension Keepers that, that I've studied. Their, their, their teachings are suppressed, either by uh, political or religious authorities. And sometimes not only their teachings are suppressed, but they themselves are, are per persecuted, be it the, the Romans who destroyed and exterminated the Essenes or the Catholic Church that exterminated the Cathars in southern France in the 13th century. They've, they've all been confronted by the, the children of darkness, if you will. And this is a, a theme that runs through all the Ascension teachings, that there's the children of light and there's the children of darkness. And the children of darkness do not want the light manifesting in our world. Ooh. So how does their legacy live on then? How does it, how can we even bring it to light? We can bring it to light by one, recognizing that there were elements of their teachings that survived. The Dead Sea Scrolls, for example, were the texts of the Essenes that were uh, hidden by the Essenes when the Roman legions were coming into Qumran and Mount Carmel and their other uh, uh, locations. The Essenes hid their teachings away in, in clay jars stashed in caves in, in Qumran. Those were discovered in 1947. The Gnostic Gospels were discovered in Egypt in 1945. So for 1500 years, we didn't have those teachings, but now we do. And modern day Ascension questers, Ascension keepers can refer to those texts. They can read them for themselves and they can begin understanding that they're part of a, a continuous line of seekers that have been attempting to transform the human race, to uplift it in a, in a positive way based on light, based on love, based on the, the premise that we can convert or transform our entire planet and our race into a, a, a planet and a civilization based on light and love rather than fear and lack. Yeah. Uh, we're living in a time where there is this rising of the spiritual and the digital avatar. Before I ask my question, first, how would you define an avatar? Traditionally, an avatar is a divine being that comes from a higher world, from another world that enters into human affairs. Think of the Buddha, think of Padmasambhava in the Tibetan tradition, think of Pitta in the Egyptian tradition, think of Jesus. These are all considered avatars. They're more than human, but they take on human incarnation in order to lead people into these higher worlds, which, which they refer to as a as source reality. They, you learn about the kingdom of heaven, you learn about the pure land in Buddhism, you learn about these original source or base realities out of which our souls originated. Yeah, and so how are the avatars important? How are they influential to us today? Well, we're anticipating numerous prophecies speak of the arrival of a new avatar or new world teachers that are entering into our world specifically for this time. And there, there are those that say that this, these avatars are in our world now. That, that's a possibility. Could be 
could be many, many, many avatars. People speak especially of the, the new children that are, are emerging and you can, you can well see how a spiritual avatar could emerge from these beings. But the unfortunate thing is, is that the children of today are confronted now, if, if they're in school today, if they're in elementary school for in Nashville or in Los Angeles or anywhere, they've got Silicon Valley in their ear saying, oh yeah, you can be an avatar. Uh, an avatar is, forget about that spiritual being nonsense. That's all just holy crap that, that doesn't have any relevance today. A real avatar is a little computer generated synthetic being that you're going to make online. You know, you could be fat and ugly or tall and short and beautiful, and you don't like yourself and your physical self. We're going to take care of that for you. We're going to help you create a cartoon version of yourself, an avatar that exists online, and it can be anything you want it to be. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. And this is going to help build your self-esteem and self-confidence. And you can interact with all your other little buddy avatars online. And you're going to start to identify more and more with your fake cartoon version of yourself than your real crappy organic biological self. That's Silicon Valley and Hollywood's message to our children today. You suck, okay? But you can become better because we're going to help you be better by building a little avatar being that can live forever, in fact. In fact, once we teach how you how to upload the contents of your pathetic little brain, your organic biological brain, you can have an IQ of 10,000 in your computer-generated avatar, and you can have more than one you. And, you know, maybe, you know, one day you'll live exclusively in our fake reality we now call the metaverse that we exclusively control. And you will be owned by us and you will serve us permanently in the metaverse. But that's OK, because, you know, this biological reality really sucks anyway. And you, you won't want to go back to it. That, that, that's what they're confronted with right now. So those are the, the two polarities. Either we're going to develop ourselves as spiritual avatars or we're going to develop into these fake simulated beings that live online. Yeah. Is there technology, William, today that you use that you appreciate, that you support, that you see actually uplifts us? Yeah, actually, you know, the, the computer and Zoom and all of that does. So long as we, we don't break the 5G barrier. Whoops, we've already broken the 5G barrier. AT&T, Verizon, they just switched on their, their 5G networks. As long as, <coughs> excuse me, as long as we were in the 3G, 4G world, which is refers to the, the the speed at which your your internet can function, we're we're in, we're okay. It's still serving us. Okay, the problem is that we're entering into now that we're into the five G world and we're headed for the six G world, is that the only reason why you want five G is not just so that it only takes two minutes to download your movie instead of an hour, but so that then they can put the implants in. They can put the neural implants in your brain. They can put it in your skin. They can put it in your eyes. And now you are 24 seven wired to the internet. That's a ring pass knot for me. I, I, uh, in 2012, I wrote a book called The Skingularity is Near, which was a warning about this technology saying, look, they, they want to get it underneath your skin. They are, these technology companies want to break the skin barrier because they know if they can get under your skin, they're under your skin permanently. And that, that has always been their goal. Wow. And that the, yet the thing is, is that once they're in your body, it's gonna be very difficult to get them out, okay? And so this is why I say, don't let them break the skin barrier unless it's a matter of life and death, or if it's temporary. If there's an off switch, you know, like with a pair of eyeglasses, you can put them on, you can take them off. Technology is, serves us. It's absolutely great. It's wonderful. So long as that is the condition, when they start to mandate it, when the government says you must let us break your skin barrier and interject into your, your sovereign being, this or that technology, that's when the red flags go up. 
And that's where we're at right now. Boy, am I with you, 100%. Thank you for that. Last week, Carolyn Corey was on. I think you know her. Mm -hmm. She's amazing. And we talked about this real-time video that her team just shot recently and it filmed Tic Tac Craft. So I want to talk to you about that. And we know it's Tic Tac Craft because it comes out, you know, in the shape of this X object. And it's said that they're flying. There's no identifiable means of propulsion. So how far in advance do you know or think that these craft are? Well, the engineers that I've spoken with that have analyzed the Tic Tac video are, are really extraordinary um, because what, what they have said and what they've looked, when they look at those videos, they look at it through, through different eyes than, than you and I do. They look at it through the eyes of physics, through science, through, through engineering. And what they're saying is that some of these craft that we see in these videos, especially the Tic Tac videos, are not from our reality. They're projections from a fifth dimensional reality into our world. We can see them, we can photograph them, but we probably couldn't like crash into them like you would a car on the 405 or something, okay? Which means they exist, but they don't really have a material existence in our world. And that's phenomenal. And with that in mind, I listened to those engineers uh, who say they're literally popping into our reality and then popping back out through wormholes. So they have consciousness that yes. although it's a projection, they are consciously coming here for purpose. Yes, okay. yes. And I, I go along with the assessment of people like Lou Elizondo, who was instrumental in, in bringing those videos to the public, he thinks they could be as much as a thousand years in advance of what we have today. Why does he say That's, that? Why does he say a thousand years? Because we presently don't have anything close to the capability of what we're seeing in those videos. And even, even if they're only a hundred years in advance of where, 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 where we're at right now. It's, it's an astounding technology. I mean, think about where we were 20 years ago. Yeah. Think about where we were 30 years ago. And now add another 70 years to where we, of where we potentially can be in 70 years. This is a, a tremendously advanced civilization. And it's one that I think has is, is always been here. Mm. This is, it's their world we're passing through, they're in total control, they, but they don't really want control in that sense. They're just a super advanced race of beings that I think is ultimately recognizing that we're just now coming into a, a level of consciousness where we can comprehend what we're actually seeing in these videos. 30 years ago, we couldn't have comprehended it. We, we could have looked at one of those videos and we wouldn't have had the, the, the advancements in wormhole theory and, and holographic theory and others that we've in, enjoyed in the past three decades uh, to, to be able to look at those videos, but not just look at those videos to actually be able to see what is going on. Do you have any sense, even though in advanced culture, what reality they're from or any purpose of why they may be revealing themselves? Well, ultimately I, I would say their, their purpose seems to be peaceful. Mm -hmm. The reason I say that is because in all of the videos they're, they're, they're almost playing with our Navy pilots, okay? They're not being antagonistic. They have jammed radar, which uh, technically is an act of war but they jammed the radar just because they could. I mean, they were just literally playing with these guys. And the, the important thing to me is that they are coming from another reality. And, and that's very important. And the reason why it gets back to this avatar concept of super advanced beings that project themselves from a higher reality. And, and the, the real reason that's important is because the US military, Silicon Valley, they operate on a, a premise that says 
all of this reality is just a video game that that you deb debbie and you william you're just a player in a game and you have no existence outside of this game this this business about your divine self a, a soul being a divine spark that came from a higher finer realm and you've you've come into this world you've incarnated in this realm in order to explore and eat chocolate and do all the wonderful things you can do in this realm and you will one day return to that original source reality to the u.s military to silicon valley engineers that's total nonsense there is only a simulated reality a video game that was created by a super advanced civilization and we now are right on the cusp of being able to create our own simulated reality and that's what we're doing with Facebook's metaverse and other corporations that are involved in that. So the videos like the Tic Tac give me a lot of hope and a lot of inspiration that there is an advanced race out there that is here to help us and that they are spiritually based. And tell people who may not be aware of this yet, some of the parameters of what the Tic Tac craft show how they fly, going into water, out of water, things like that. Yeah, so beginning in uh, 2007, the, the Pentagon, the US Navy started leaking these videos that were taken by Navy pilots, some of them off the coast of California, many of them off the coast of California, some off the East Coast. And the pilots apparently have been reporting these incidents practically on a daily basis. They'll be out on a training mission and all of a sudden they'll, they'll see something and they'll be allowed to give chase to it. And they report that they can go from say 80,000 feet to two feet above the ocean in a matter of seconds. They can even dive into the ocean and then pop back out, meaning they're, they're capable of, they're, 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 they're called transmedium craft. We don't have anything they can go from the air into the water and back up into the air. They, they, they seem to travel at, at, at uh, speeds well beyond anything a human flesh and blood body could, could tolerate. We're talking thousands of miles per hour. They, they seem to be, uh, if not prescient, they're, they're able to read the minds of our pilots, suggesting that they have uh, a superior consciousness of their own. These are just a few of the capabilities that are exemplified by these videos and also uh, testified to by the pilots who have, who have given them chase and who have personally witnessed them. Amazing. Do you think that interstellar travel should be one of the big goals for humanity? No, I don't. Um, I, 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 I'm still hung up on the biblical adage that flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of heaven. And what we keep trying to do is to say this fragile little body that has a, a finite existence, we're going to put it in a tin can, a firecracker, and we're going to blast it into space and it's going to survive. But even NASA knows that that's not true. Since the space program began uh, as far back as 1962, we knew our body, our flesh and blood body cannot live in space. We're far too fragile. The radiation, the loneliness, pooping in a tube. That's Nobody funny. wants to do that. Who wants to drink their urine for the rest of their life? You know, as nutritious as it is. Uh, th these are some of the issues the astronauts confront. And NASA's answer to that is transhumanism. We're going to turn ourselves into machines. We're going to turn ourselves into robots and blast ourselves into space. But the spiritual people have always known that our body itself is a vehicle that was designed, it is meant to be transmuted into a light being form, an energetic form, so that then can project or beam itself to another location in space time and phase back into its physical existence. This is where I, I feel that we should be putting our time, our energy and emotion and the trillions of dollars that we're investing into the space program. At least let's give it a try. I mean, if we even took a fraction of what we're spending on trying to move into space, to migrate into space and put it into developing ourselves spiritually, we would one, find 
hey, we've got a garden planet here. There might be 10,000 Earth-like planets within several light years of here, but we should really focus on staying here first, clean up our act, and then think about going out into space. And by then we'll, we'll realize that we don't need to do it by putting ourselves in Jeff Bezos's or, or Elon Musk penis shaped firecracker and blasting ourselves out seven people at a time. Is there a way, William, that we could use our most advanced science and our most advanced spiritual teachings in order to produce and create something we haven't yet, something magnificent, sustainable? I am 99.999% sure that we don't want to advance ourselves with that technology. But that 0.0001%, I hold the door open and say, well, maybe there is a way that we can use this technology to advance ourselves. I, I, my personal view, and again, I've been writing about this subject and studying it, thinking about it since 2001, 2002. My belief is, is that we need to activate our ascension intelligence, our angelic intelligence, and then think about utilizing artificial intelligence. Because my premise is, is that if we can activate our ascension and angelic intention, intelligence the way the Buddha did, the way Christ did, the way other avatars like uh, Padmasambhava or Tara, the way that they did, and they have the same body that you and I have. So it's capable. We all have the same capability that if we can learn to do that, we won't need the technology. We won't need the technology. And the technology is the source of all the weirdness in our world right now. It's, it's the technology that's led us to rape our planet and of its resources and to now have uh, more and more wars over these resources. We're, we're realizing that there are rare earth elements that are required in order to develop this technology. And World War III will be about control of those resources. So if it's such a problem, we, we really don't want to try to go down that road. We need spiritual advancement. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, there are these ancient sites. You talk about them crazy you know, enormous stones, they would have needed precision instruments to build them and move them. It's, mm -hmm. it's impossible. Right. What are they? Are they actually gateways to other dimensions? What's your knowing about this? I, I believe that many of these ancient sites, certainly not all of them, but in, in my study and my understanding and exploration, there, there was a more advanced, spiritually advanced civilization that existed on this planet 12,000 years ago. And it, it suffered a cataclysm. And it was that civilization that left us many of these wonders that uh, we, we, we still today are just absolutely dumbfounded by. I'm talking about some of the sites in Egypt and Peru and elsewhere. And this civilization, one of its hallmarks was its ability to build megalithic structures. They, they could, they could with tremendous precision, craft 80 to 100 ton uh, blocks of red granite, for example, and put them in place in a temple like the Osirion in, in ancient Egypt. And then they would talk about how these, these temples were used as portals or gateways. They were transfiguration devices that they would use that would enable them to transfigure their body into a, a higher form and project or beam themselves to, to other uh, civilizations in the stars. That's what they were capable of doing. And they might have had some kind of extraordinary technology that, that assisted them. But primarily, their number one technology was consciousness itself. They, they had the same body that we, that you and I did, but they knew how to activate it. And that's the angelic or ascension intelligence I was referring to a moment ago. And, and that's what keeps me digging in these civilizations is, is the realization that they knew how to, to do these things with the power of their mind. They could activate their, their, their biology in ways that we have forgotten how to do. And it's, it's an imperative for us to learn how to do that. So activating our angelic ascension intelligence as an antidote to the artificial intelligence. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And when you refer to these ancients, 
with this great consciousness that they used. Do you know who they were? Do you know who built them and why? No, we don't actually. We have references to these civilizations. In Egypt, they're the Shemsu Hor, the children of Horus, for example. Um, they're, they're thought to have been, been the Atlanteans and, and other uh, civilizations that are familiar to, to those who study lost civilizations. But no, we don't know enough about them. Um, there's one group, I call them the Immortals of the Sheath. They're, they're, these are ancient beings. They're, they're called the Tuatadanan in, in Britain and Ireland. And they're an advanced race of beings that were luminous. They were, they're called the Shining Ones. Uh, they had the ability to wrap themselves in a sheath that is sort of like a fog or a mist that could enable them to travel uh, around the planet and perhaps even off the planet as well and enable them to manipulate matter. Um, these were normal capabilities that, that, that individuals possessed in this civilization and then they were lost. But then these beings emerged after that cataclysm and began to restart civilization. This is why we find evidence of them literally all over the world. And is this what led you to want to do the tours that you do, the luxury tours around the world? Yeah, uh, my wife Claire and I have been uh, leading tours together for 10 years. I've been leading tours for 20 years to these sacred sites. And there's nothing more wondrous really than, than taking someone that's had a lifelong dream of going to Stonehenge or going to Peru or going to Israel, going to Egypt or Southern France and putting them face to face with some of these temples or works of art. It is tremendously fulfilling. But what it also does is it, it aids in, 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 in that path of remembrance because every time we, we think about these places we're, we're actually trying to remember and we're putting that, the pieces together of not only our individual puzzle but also our collective puzzle. And so tell me more about that because I'm fascinated by the tours. Um, what kind of places do you go? What can people experience? What, what, mm -hmm. what do you deliver at these sacred sites that is very unique? Well, one thing, our tours are based on uh, the concept of ascension. So we're, 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 we'll go to Egypt, uh, for example, and there's, there's lots of tours that are your traditional tours. They tell you nothing about anything. I mean, it's kind of funny um, what your, your traditional tour will do. And then you have uh, folks that are in my field. Some are really into the stones and bones. How do they lift those, those massive blocks? And, and that's a, a really cool exploration. And then our tour looks at the stones and bones, but also looks at it from a metaphysical or a spiritual perspective. How, not only how did they lift them, but who were, what was the consciousness, consciousness like of the people who, who did create these temples and why did they, why did they need to build them? And what, what is the concept of ascension that was driving those, those cultures? And, and why is that culture so different from our own? And so that, that kind of separates our tour in that we're, we take more of a spiritual focus on it. And we're also looking at their ascension secrets. Yum. Sounds great. Oh, plus we, our tours are, are, are straight five-star tours too, like true five-star tours. Lots, lots of folks will advertise their tours five-star, but mm, not really. Ours is actually bona fide five-star. We, we work with in Egypt with Abercrombie and Kent. They're a, a, a world-renowned luxury tour provider. And it's just a, a dramatically different experience. And that's something that we really enjoy is just spoiling our guests in ways perhaps they they might not normally be used to being spoiled. Some are, but but others are like, wow, this is this is incredible. I feel like I'm floating along on a cloud. That's what they tell us on our tours. And are these typically one or two week or do they vacillate? The Egypt tour, our Egypt tour is 15 days. Uh, we have a Portals of Camelot tour of England, looking at all of the, some of the meg megalithic sites in England with a focus on the Holy Grail and the Holy Family. That's an a uh, nine day tour. So a lot of it depends on the location um, and uh, also the, the time of year when we're going. I'm curious, William, what your legacy is or what you would like it to be. 
you're on television, you're, you speak, you lead these tours, you're clearly very passionate. You started out going mm -hmm. to school to be, do entertainment law and the Bible gotcha. <laughs> and it, you know, beautifully so, because it turns you into this very curious mind still today. So what does all of it mean for what you want to, oh, not just leave behind, but what you want to be creating now, what you want to be remembered for, what kind of service you want to provide? Well, again, it's, um, I've been a, a quote unquote, kind of a pioneer in this, this ascension field and been connecting dots uh, for a very long time in, the, in this area. And I feel like if I can advance that field, put it into, a, give it a really solid foundation uh, from an academic perspective, especially, that that would be a, a tremendous legacy to pull Ascension out from behind the curtain uh, where it has largely has been, it's been mostly hidden, uh, that, that's enormous. And then two, to, to give it a, a real solid academic uh, foundation uh, for future generations to say, hey, this isn't just something some guy channeled. You know, all of a sudden he's like, oh, we're going to ascend to Andromeda or whatever. It's not about that. It, it, you get a lot of that in the kind of the, the new age. And I don't mean that in a disparaging way because there's a lot of well-intentioned, open, good-hearted people that are ascension coaches now. But the, the thing is, is that we really need it to be, uh, to connect the dots with its origins. And, and that's something that I, I, I hope that I'm doing for people. I know that you're talking at the Conscious Life Expo coming up a um, couple of times, panels and your own speaking. What can people mm -hmm. hear if they would like to go see you or live stream it? So the, my first uh, talk, well, first of all, I'll be on a panel with Jimmy Church on Friday evening talking about megalithic sites. I'm really looking forward to that. Then on Saturday, I'll be doing the George Nury panel, which is always a really fun thing to do where we, we those are often conversations that uh, are about forward thinking, what's what's coming up. Um, I've, I've been doing this, uh, uh, participating in this conference since its inception. Uh, so it's really fun to return year after year and to see how the, the conversations are advancing and where we're going next. I mean, I remember back 12 years ago, we were looking, wow, 2012 is coming. Where was going to happen? And now here we are well past the transformative moment of 2012 and we're into this new era feeling a little uncharted. So I know George is gonna to wanna to be getting into that. Then I do my presentation on resetting the reset, which is bringing awareness to what is happening right now um, technologically. So people have an understanding of that. It's, it's, it's not, uh, not totally fear-based. Some people are, are timid around that subject to try to work in the, you know, the positive solutions uh, that we all need to be working on with this. It's it's one thing just to you know blow to the galleries about oh what Silicon Valley has in store for us. It's another to say well here's how we can navigate through it, and that's what I'm trying to do uh, in my talk on Saturday, and then on Monday I have my post-conference workshop which is about activating our future light self. And this is uh, entirely art driven, art driven. It's about the light body. It's about connecting with our true self hmm. and uh, how we can tap into the, the powers of our soul. So go from a, a kind of a focus on technology to a focus on the soul on Monday. Oh, that's beautiful. That sounds very exciting. I'll be there. And so oh, folks who would like to go, I wouldn't miss it. Go to Los Angeles Conscious Life Expo .com. You can attend in person. Highly recommended. I mean, you get to hang out with people like William, you get to hear him speak. And if for some reason you're in another country or consciousness and you can't, you can live stream it and you can still get tickets. Highly, highly recommended. And is there anything you do on a daily basis, William? Any daily practice or ritual that helps keep you grounded and really centered and healthy? Yeah, I'm, one of the things I'm noted for is utilizing sacred art for meditation. Mm. This is a pun intended, a lost art. Mm -hmm. uh, so many of us are, are working on connecting to our future self and our light body. We're doing the meditations, this kind of thing. But we don't have a clear enough vision of our divine nature. And what I started uh, uh, picking up on gosh, it's been like 10 years ago now, was that 
in, in all of the world's sacred tradition, there is an aspect of it that says the most direct way to connect with your, your true self, with your divine self, your future light self, is through sacred images, images of, of beings who are portrayed in that state. And so I've spent literally the past 10 years collecting images that are open eye meditations on the light body with the understanding that most of the time you're, you're looking at an image of a guru or an avatar who has the capability of connecting with you through the artwork. And I, I get deep into the, the, the explanations of quantum entanglement and other modern scientific theories about how a piece of art can be a conduit to the divine realms. It sounds like kind of out there, but it, it has a ancient uh, pedigree to it and also has modern neuroscience attached to it too. Every time you look at an image, say, of, of Jesus bursting into light or Padmasambhava morphing into his rainbow light body, your mirror neurons in your neocortex are firing as if that is happening to you. And so your body already knows how to do this. And what the caterpillar needs to morph into the butterfly is that the activation that can be provided by contemplation, meditation, and reflection on sacred art. So that is my daily bread. I'm working with images. I'm contemplating, meditating, reflecting on images. I'm utilizing them as an open eye meditation. And I teach and encourage others how to do the same. In, in addition to all the other tools in their kit, this is one that uh, could be one that can really help them to suddenly and dramatically accelerate uh, their spiritual growth. I am so glad I asked that question. That Thank was you. such a unique answer. And you just gave me something, certainly, I never considered before. And I know these images you're talking about. I've been looking at them my whole life. And some of us, you know, we really love someone in particular, feel very called or moved by them just energetically. You know, you get these right. beautiful laminated postcards and, and I've yeah. carried these cards around, but I never considered this would be something that could actually influence a change like a, at a cellular level, at a spiritual level. Absolutely. The, the Gnostics had an expression, the image will show you the way. And you can enter the divine realm through the image. And I've got hundreds of examples, literally, of, of sacred art that was created intentionally as a conduit, as a way for you to connect with the divine. And it, it's, 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 it's a lot of fun to, to show the images because one, you, people's faces just light up when they're in the presence of these divine beings in the art. And then when they realize that it is actually has a psychoactive aspect to it, now that, that suddenly is like putting a, 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 a lock in or a key in a lock. It, it opens up doors in our minds and out here that we never knew existed. Okay, that's an awesome tool. And this is Dare to Dream, William. What do you next dare to dream? Where do your future dreams or goals? Oh, well, to be a better guitar player. <laughs> <laughs> Note his guitar in the background, which I asked about. Is that really, you want to work on your guitar playing? Yeah, absolutely, because I feel like when I'm in that moment, when I'm playing the guitar, I'm, I'm in, a, in a state of real high alignment. And I just love the idea um, just very quickly. It's is part of a, an aspect of what I was saying about this base reality that we come from. I mean, it, it, the, the, the teaching is that there is a more perfect world and we can tap into it. And everything in our world originates in that more perfect world. And an example of this is the song Yesterday. It's the most recorded song of all time. And it's, a, it's attributed to John Lennon and Paul McCartney, specifically Paul McCartney, who would perform it solo with the Beatles. And, and they talk about how that had a, an impact on the Beatles that it started the breakup when Paul was playing by himself. But what I, the point I'm wanting to make is that Paul McCartney himself said, I didn't write that song. I dreamed it. Mm, wow. I dreamed that song. So where did that song come from? Did it come from Paul McCartney's subconscious? Did it come from an Akashic record type of a thing? Or 
Is there a more perfect version of yesterday somewhere out there in the universe that Paul McCartney heard? And his version is an echo of that original perfect version. And if that's the case, what did the original sound like? I mean, that just spins my head around. And I start to think, wow, okay, that lots of artists talk about that, uh, especially musicians, that they dream songs or they're hearing something that is not from this world and they're trying to bring it into this world to make it a better place. And that is sort of my intention with the guitar as well, is that each of us as musicians, you can hear something that nobody else has heard, but it's sometimes and often is coming from another realm. And by bringing that song into this realm, we create a bridge. Yeah. I sing in a band called Lions of Lyra, like the planet. Oh, and yeah. That is my dream. That actually is my dream, is to dream, to receive from the cosmos the next song, the next original song to perform and sing. And yeah. so if it's you been get it. once, yeah. it's done again. Yeah. <laughs> That's beautiful. And so folks who want to find out more about you, your show, your books, you have many books out, your luxury tours, williamhenry.net, best place. That's correct. Yeah. Thank you very much. Williamhenry.net. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's been a joy. My pleasure, Debbie. And I look forward to seeing you at the Conscious Life Expo this weekend. And please, everybody, come on out. It's a great time. There's wonderful people there. It's a, it's a transformative experience. You're going to meet new friends. You're going to get new insights and you're going to feel uplifted. It's got a great way to get your year off into a, a really powerful start. A thousand percent. Yeah, you will love it. Uh, I couldn't miss it. And I look forward to it every year. So I hope to see you guys there. Say hello to me as well. And I end today's show with this quote from Dr. Mikio Kaku. We should be open. Many physicists are skeptical because the stars are so far away, but that assumes ET is only a century ahead of us. Imagine if the aliens are millions of years ahead and more advanced than us, then new laws of physics open up. So indeed, keep an open mind. Subscribe to this number one transformation conversation, Dare to Dream, and leave a comment. I read them all and I do get back to you. Next week on the show, the worldwide astrologer, Susan Miller is here. She is giving you a complete breakdown of the entire year, month by month, and everything to look out for, as well as for your individual sign. Thank you so much for joining us today and for daring to dream and remember everything that William shared and what you can do to keep your consciousness here and keep growing and staying healthy and well.